It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing my buddy, my role model, my idol, Dr. Jeanette McLean, who is a diplomat of the American Board of Pediatric Dentistry, fellow of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, private practice owner, and mother of two. She received her dental degree with honors from the University of Southern California in 2003 and completed her specialty training in pediatric dentistry in 2005 at Sunrise Children's Hospital through the University of Nevada School of Medicine. Dr. McLean is become an international recognized advocate and expert on silver diamine fluoride appearing in newspapers the new york times yeah i can't believe i have someone in my house that was on the cover of the new york times magazines television and continued education lectures on this hot topic by the way her dental town online course on silver diamine fluoride i think we have 441 courses and yours is top viewed for 2017 yeah yeah, yeah that's uh -huh. cr i mean so four, I think I think it's 470 courses and yours was most viewed. That's 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 freaking impressive. Uh, most notably, she was featured in the July 2016 New York Times article: "A cavity fighting liquid helps kids avoid dentists and drills," uh, which brought national attention to the option of treating cavities non-invasively with silver diamine fluoride. You know, it's so. Um, thanks so much for coming here. Thanks. And for she's me. wearing a shirt. She brought me. <laughs> A girly bag, and uh, <laughs> and uh, bag. well, only a girl would bring you a, 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 a bag and a treat. Bag. But a shirt back in black. That is so damn cool. GV Black. Now I don't think he even went to dental school, did he? That's a good question. I don't think so either. Yeah, I think they were all apprentices back then. <laughs> I, I really I'll do. I'll have to study that. Yeah. I don't um, even know. Uh, Google that, Ryan. Did GV Black go to dental school? Yeah, and if so, where? Yeah. I, well, he was from Illinois, wasn't he? I'm not sure. But um, anyway, um, you remind me more of Pierre Fichard. You just look more Frenchy. I don't know what I don't know. I don't know what that means. It's you the stripes. It's the stripes. But yeah. Yeah. You need to wear a French hat. And a start. beret. Yeah. Absolutely. But um, I um, you know, I used to always tease because when you look at the nine specialties, I mean, if you got a hundred in it, honest in the room, they they don't mm -hmm. argue with each other. Um, it, but when it comes to occlusion. It's really like world religions. I mean, you have the Buddhist and the Hindus. Yeah. And my oh, oldest sister is a Catholic carries. nun. Yeah. I couldn't give her, send her a book and turn her into a Lutheran. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't even know if she thinks Lutherans go to heaven. I mean, you know, they're, yeah. just, they're just that fanatic in their camps. But I always say, if you got 100 pediatric dentists in the room or ended on, you know, they wouldn't disagree on anything. But gosh darn, pediatric dentists, now they have an argument. S uh, yeah, silver I was going to say, I disagree. Yeah. We're not even on just SDF, but there's, if you put a case or x-rays, you will have, you know, from 10 dentists, 10 opinions on how to best treat that. Well, you know, we, we have research on that because uh, you're so young, I don't know, you remember the Reader's Digest story? I remember Reader's Digest. <laughs> but but you know, they had a guy, and he took study models and FMX to 30 different dentists, and he got 30 different treatment plans, mm -hmm. and they ran, that was the feature story on Reader's Digest. And all the dentists were all mad, and I said, well, don't shoot the messenger. Reader's Digest is not fake news. My mom, dad, and grandmas and grandpas all have it on their end yeah. table. And it's true. You know, sometimes is truth is an inconvenient fact. So then the NHS said, is it true? We don't, oh, I don't, we don't know. So they said, we're going to expand it to 100. So they went and redid the study, went to 100 different dentists, 98 different treatment lines. The two of them were the same. Those were the two guys who said, do nothing. So two people said, do nothing. Mm -hmm. And then number three to 100 had a different treatment plan. And that's when you have to realize that dentistry isn't math. Right. It's an art and a it, science, exactly. and it's got huge opinions. That, that's the truth. And I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing because, really? you know, I mean, there's not like one gospel way to treat things. That you ha to me, I like giving parents or patients options, meaning that there's not one. It, it's not what I want to do. I can tell you the options and then you have to decide what's but most I want to start. To I wanna, this is Dentistry Uncensored. So I want to start below the belt, the mm -hmm. biggest punch I can give you. And that is you and I practice in Arizona and we both know that down in Yuma, um, mm -hmm. twice 
a baby has died. Mm -hmm. And the news to me is very unfair because they don't ever portray it like, well, why does your two-year-old baby need put to sleep right. and need a half dozen root canals? Right. Is that parent abuse? Um, are you kissing that baby with rotted mouth? Is mm -hmm. a babysitter your grandmother that has gum disease and five right. cavities? But the dentist- you bring up many the, interesting but, but, points. But it wasn't, <laughs> but it wasn't a, um, a sham. I mean, it was a board-certified pediatric dentist, correct? At the Cool Smiles, I they're general dentists. Oh, and the Yuma was a general dentist. To the best of my knowledge, okay. I, you know, it's but, general dentistry. But, but so I, I want to start with this. Um, I have four grandchildren. Mm -hmm. I don't want them to die in the OR getting right. pulpotomies and chrome silk crowns. Right. So how? Do, and then whenever it happens, it's all over social media. Well, that, that's the problem. Let's start. There. Um, so when that tragedy in Yuma happened and that came out in the media, it wasn't until January and it had occurred in, in December. But when that hit the news, the same week we saw headlines about a Department of Justice settlement against Cool Smiles clinics to the tune of $24 million for fraudulent billing, you know, either for procedures that didn't need to be done or um, never were done. So, you know, when that was going on, I mean, I guess I'm a glutton for punishment, but I, I was looking at the comments online and the recurring theme from mothers was, I'm not taking my kid to the dentist. And, and what does that accomplish? You know, if you don't bring your kid in, do, do they stay disease free? Does the disease get better by itself? No, right? It usually gets worse. It usually gets to the point where you have to do the more invasive procedures like sedation and pulpotomies and stainless steel crowns. So, you know, we, we have a dilemma where we're almost like our worst and our own worst enemy. And in terms of bad PR, when you see these um, headlines of kids going in under ge dental anesthesia or general anesthesia to get dental treatment and then having the adverse outcomes, you know, the, the problem is that there's always going to be a need in my specialty, pediatric dentistry for s sedation and general anesthesia, because many of these children have disease that's beyond the minimally invasive treatments like silver diamine fluoride or art or whatnot because they have decay that's into the pulp or they have active infection and, and pain, and we have to use that. that but the, the, the issue is that sedation is now being used more and more frequently which is a whole other topic of, in of itself. You know, is it just because we're seeing more disease? Is it our style or training as pediatric dentists? Or is it the parents or lack of parenting and, and parenting styles today where, you know, they want the kid just to be asleep and not remember anything and the convenience of it? You know, the, there's all these factors. It's a very complicated issue and there's no right or wrong answer. Like you said earlier, you know, we all have these different opinions. You know, the problem is... Um, the public, you know, they're, they're, we talk about access to care issues, and, and it's not just not that there aren't enough dentists out there, but part of it is sometimes the parents don't want to bring the kids to us because they have that fear of when they see the, the headlines of death or they see a headline about unnecessary treatment being done. You know, we have to regain trust, I think, in, in the public's eye. You know, in my... 55 years, my 30 years, my, my don't price turned 30 last September uh, 21, 1987. Yeah, my marriage only lasted 20, but my dental office lasted 30. <laughs> How's that? How's that? My dental office went 50% longer. Um, I, I, the biggest change I've noticed in society in the 30 years that I've owned a business is trust is going downhill yeah. in our leaders. I mean, for 20 years, I, I think it's embarrassing when people are proud of being a particular party. It's like both parties have had an 11% approval rating right. for 20 years. So you're proud of your party when nine, when 89% of the people don't trust it. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, so when you take your, um, I grew up with five sisters. I played Barbie dolls till I was 12. So when the engine light comes on, for me, it's the idiot light. I've never looked under a hood one time. Mm -hmm. So when the man comes out and says, I need a new alternator, I, yeah, I, trust ha I have to say. trust. Yeah. So when I take my granddaughter to you and you say, she's got four cavities, I have to trust right. you. And most and people trust still is, trust that. But, but then you see that declining because then people, and, and part of it might be, the media or the living in the electronic age where we could go online and email friends or we could go on Facebook or in chat rooms and in the mommy groups and discuss, 
you know, just say, hey, I went to the dentist and my kid had 10 cavities. What do you guys think about it? And they're looking to their friends for the opinions as opposed to trusting Now, are dads allowed in mommy groups or are you guys just sexist? <laughs> are you guys just sexist animals? I'm not. Uh, yeah, it's just women. <laughs> I just, and we are sexist. Oh, like, my gosh. I'm being discriminated against. <laughs> but, um, you know, there, there's definitely a trend where we, we're losing trust in people in positions of authority, not just in dentists or car mechanics or politicians. You know, the, the problem is because there's, you know, a few bad apples, when that hits the media and gets shared over and over oh, and over the again. Oh, the guy across the street from me owns Grulick Auto we Supply. We get grouped in. You and know, he we get says he gets all of his business from his school, his church, the Little League deals, because right. nobody trusts his trade. And when they're meeting yeah. him on the playground, they're like, you know, will you not lie to me if mm -hmm. I bring my car to you? I mean, trust. Tr right. It's frustrating because the majority of us obviously got into this because we want to help people and we are honest and we're doing the best that we can to the best of our knowledge. You know, but there are instances where there are people with unscrupulous business practices who what percent do of the, What percent negative. of the general dentist do you think that you, how long have you had your pediatric dental practice in Arizona? I moved back in 2005 when I graduated and, and I've been so at the same years. practice, but the practice is much longer, than, much older than but in your had, 13 like 40 years, years. In your 13 years, what reputation. percent of dentists do you think are unscrupulous that you've seen in, with your own eyes? I think it's the small minority. But how small? Really small. How small? I, I never even thought about it to put a number of it, but I'm sh oh, like oh, a small percentage. But I mean, the you think it's one out of a hundred? You just, think it's one in But 10? it's not just about um, greed or fraudulent. Sometimes we're doing things because we were taught that it was the right thing. Like we, you have, know, a, we like, have a we have a big dilemma here in Ahwatukee, um because um, we're all friends. We're all drinking alcoholic buddies. You mm -hmm. know, we all. Um, eat cheeseburgers and drink together. But I swear <laughs> to God, you show a bite wing to one of the guys, he doesn't see any cavities. Yeah, yeah. And then that, my other it. buddy sees like eight, exactly. and then I see like four. Right. Well, and I, it's, I think and of it's myself three as, good guys mm -hmm. that disagree. Right. Yeah. So I think of myself as very conservative, but the way I was trained, I now like to refer to it as Medicaid mentality where we were trained that we were somehow doing the kids a favor by aggressively treatment planning them. So any white spot lesion, um, they're getting a filling. If, because if they I, might not ever be back? That was the mentality. Yeah. Or, or like any interproximal lesion was automatic stainless steel crown. But then when I got into private practice where it wasn't a majority Medicaid population and it was mostly you were in cash pay, uh, <laughs> it was mostly cash pay or, or private insurance, um, that did not fly. When, when they were put in the bill, you know, and you say, oh, well, that's a class two, let's do a stainless steel crown. They're like, whoa, 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 you know, because they, they're, they're, all they're seeing are dollar signs. And, and there was this demand to try to be more conservative. And I would do a filling instead of a crown. And then to my surprise and delight, did that tooth abscess and blow up like I was thought that it would? No, usually they fared very well and the composites held up well. So it just showed me that I didn't always have to be so aggressive. I mean, that's just one step in, in me changing. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold your feet to the fire though. I'm, I'm going back to death. I'm the uh, the grim reaper. Oh my God. <laughs> is, is the papoose board not an option? I mean, if, no, it's if still putting an you under- It's still an option, absolutely. It's still an option? Yeah, it's a very controversial thing. But you know, if, for me, I, I do have papoose boards in my practice and we use them when we're doing oral conscious sedation, because I don't want the kid and what is oral conscious floor. sedation? That's when you drink. Right, right. But, a I mean, but what is what is your medication. what is your um, cocktail? Most often, I use Versed. Versed. Mm -hmm. um, Which is when I first started Valium. out. Um, it's in that benzodiazepine family. When I first started out, I was doing triple cocktail, which I don't. And what was the triple? Anymore. So that's when the kids were more deeply and what was sedated. So we would use like chloral hydrate, Demerol, hydroxazine. So um, I've really put the brakes on sedation. The narcotics. Right, because we were seeing more adverse ad outcomes. Um, and then also becoming a mother, I, uh, my approach to treatment planning is, is different because, you know, having been on the flip side of it, um, my daughter had surgery when she was nine months. 
And, you know, it, it's like one of those life changing experiences when you're on the other side of the table and they're saying your, your kid needs surgery. Um, you know, like the joke, like when you know too much, you worry <laughs> too much. But of course, in my mind, you're a bad patient parent. Yeah, questioning everything, <laughs> you know. But, um, you know, when I was younger and I didn't have kids of my own, I had that, like, you know, the doctor, I, like, you have to do what I said, and, and my word is the gospel. And I, I used to get annoyed when parents would have all the questions because I was very dismissive of their fears until I became a parent and I was the one with all the questions and the fears. So now I, I feel I can empathize better with the parents and take the time to acknowledge their concern and, and engage in a, in a discussion yeah, and build I, I their trust. I got to interrupt you with a, with a funny story. Um, I met a dentist in Albuquerque and he practiced in Los Alamos. Well, it's all nuclear scientists and they're all on the edge of the, the <laughs> scientific universe. Yeah. And he quit because every freaking scientist would come in with like 30 questions yeah. for a filling. Right. Like, and, they, and he couldn't even answer half the questions about these resin right. monitors. And he finally said, <laughs> I, I can't I do an hour scientific lecture for every stupid film. Yeah, I, I and so we it. left. It, it's frustrating because, you know, like another joke is our, we dread the moms and dads that are nurses or engineers yeah. Yeah. because they always have all the questions, um, like the more high maintenance. But having been on the flip side of that now, you know, I, I find that if I take the time to discuss with them, I build their trust and they become the most loyal best advocates of our practice like we really don't spend anything on advertising it's all word of mouth from existing patients or pediatricians or people in the community um and i think that's a big part of it and and that parent that was questioning everything initially once you build that trust then they become like the town crier that like this is the great office and you got to go here and they're the best and people trust what they have to say so you know it's worth taking that extra time even though it might be annoying <laughs> or exhausting, but I, I think that they deserve that from us. You know, like if I went to my, if I brought my children to the pediatrician, or for example, like the, the concept of whether or not to allow parents back for treatment. When I first started out, I was trained not to let the parents back, but now I let the parents back because I'm a parent. And there's no way I would go to the pediatrician and just like send my kid back like, boy, you know, I want to be there and, and learn and hear and ask, ask questions. Like I can't, it just seemed kind of like crazy to me. Like why wouldn't we want the parents there to see what we're doing, especially because there's um, lack of trust now or question. Yeah, questioning even, even, the, the Cat us. even the Catholic Church, 1.0 mm -hmm. miles from my house, right around mm -hmm. the corner, huge lawsuits. And the whole, the whole Catholic community in Ahwatukee was shaken. Yeah. Um, um, Penn State coaches, I mean, yeah. God, when you when you read the media, your kid's dying at the pediatric dentist, the priests are crazy, the right. coaches that's, at that's Penn State That's their news feed, so yeah. of course they're afraid. So, you know, I, I can build their trust. And then eventually we get to the point where often they're like, go ahead, you'll, I'm going to sit out here on my smartphone and you go do your okay. appointment. Like eventually we do get to that point once we've established the trust. But if it's someone new to me and they don't know me, you know, I, I don't blame them for having those concerns. So so then why do some kids need IV sedation if you can sedate them and put them in a papoose board? Why do they need IV sedation? Yeah. It, it, well, it depends on a lot of factors. Yeah. Oral conscious sedation doesn't work on everyone. Like one in five kids will have what we call a paradoxical reaction where they're actually worse when you sedate them, especially with Versed they'll get what we call the angry drunk reaction with their, it, it's like an exorcism. Are you talking to me or Ryan? Work on that. Are you talking to me or Ryan? <laughs> right. right. So, so it's, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of things. It, I can, there are some three-year-olds that will let me give them a shot, put a rubber dam, drill their tooth, fill their tooth, and they just sit there like an angel, no problem. Then you'll get a 10-year-old who's like, they look at you walking in the door and they're screaming and crying and freaking out. You know, so it, it depends on the behavior and that child's coping skills, which, you know, in our era of the snowflake children, a lot of kids today don't have good coping skills. <laughs> yeah. Right? That's why they're going off to college and they can't, like, they can't cope. But anyway, that's another story. That is, but, a <laughs> that is really crazy. I mean, like, like when, when you, you're supposed to feel guilty if you didn't help your kids do homework. Could you imagine going up to my dad and saying, Dad, will you help me with your homework? I bet if I hand him the book, he would have taken the book, hit me over the head with it, and thrown it on the right. floor. I mean, 
Right. It goes back to my, what my I dad went earlier. to one wrestling match. I was a varsity wrestler for four years. He went to one match, and now if a child misses a match. You know, it's like... Right, if you're not there yeah. every single one, you're a bad parent. Yeah, it, the parenting styles have changed dramatically, and that's a huge reason why we're often forced to do more sedation is because parents have the expectation that their child shouldn't cry for anything. You know, there's some kids who don't even... Or some parents who don't even want us to do a cleaning on the kid because they're crying, or they won't brush their kid's teeth at home because they cry. I'm like, who is the parent? My kids used to cry because they had a poopy diaper and they didn't want their diaper changed or they used to cry when I tried to put them in the car seat. Am I going to like leave them sitting in poop and not put them in a car yeah. seat? Like it's just like, duh. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't get, but. Um, yeah, where, where it, it, it's we almost like we're stem, dumbing down the society. From? Yes. I mean, we, we, we yeah. really are. I mean, um, I, I think, and uh, I've seen some really well done scientific studies that, you know, um, back then everyone was working. Mm -hmm. And they were working a lot just to pay the bills and eat and survive, and they were happier. Yeah. But now that they're working less and they have more free time, they're playing with their navel and getting unhappy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or looking at their news feed yeah. and seeing everyone having their like highlight reel of everything is fabulous, and then the, yeah. there's a lot of depression. So I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so so um, so I've never heard anybody say the angry. The the angry angry drunk oh yeah, reaction. so we, we were talking about what would lead to needing IV sedation. So, you know, some kids you can work on them with just behavior management, tell show do. Some kids are, are fine with nitrous oxide. Then you have kids who need a little more, like they might be afraid to put the nitrous hood on them. Um, so that you could give them oral sedatives and they might do very well. But there are those that their behavior almost gets worse when you do the oral sedation. So which one of those and patients do you think Ryan is? He seems like nice and, and, and pleasant. So usually those are the happy drunks. Okay. But the kids who like start out like they won't look at you and they're like those often become worse. Although once in a while the Hellion kids become an angel and the parents are like, can I get a bottle of this for at home or for a car ride? Um, but the thing is you have less of a working window with the oral conscious sedation. And there's some children who come to us with a full mount, you know, 20 rotted abscess baby teeth, and you, we really have no other option. Well, I wanna, it's like I, it's I wanna, better to do yeah, the general I, I wanna, anesthetic. And get all done. I, I want to go back to that because um, <clears throat> to me, it's, you know, it, it's hard to say anything came good out of AIDS, but I, I, I lived through the AIDS. I mean, it was, it was in 79. I graduated from high school in 80. Please don't tell me you weren't born then. Were I you was born, born in 76. All oh, right. You made my day. <laughs> so it was in 79, um, and, and it was just like Reagan never mentioned. I, mean, I, I very, very much remember watching all that in the media as a child. Yeah, like Reagan never mentioned HIV or AIDS yeah. or gay or homosexual, mm -hmm. his entire presidency. And it was just, and it, the story was just slowly dribbling out. It yeah. started off as gay cancer, all this stuff. But the, but the one positive thing of the whole HIV thing is the entire plan. Planet got religion on STDs. Mm -hmm. the, the only one who thought it really was South Africa, which now has a 25% HIV positive rate. Uh, Ryan and I have lectured there, and when you go to every dental office, the dentist's like, well, who cares about their decay? They're all HIV positive. So it's all, eight. you go to dental offices, and the whole dental office is mm -hmm. HIV, all this stuff like that, yeah. because their president uh, thought it was a, a lie, thought it was a conspiracy, and uh, didn't let the World Health Organization come in. But all the other... Countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, they, they all got religion. And I feel like that process hasn't even started yet with the other end of the body. I mean, everybody right. knows that you can get gonorrhea, syphilis, chlamydia, mm -hmm. you know, down below the bell, but they don't realize when this newborn baby is born, you hand it to grandma, and she's got an upper denture, lower parcels, six millimeter pockets, hadn't been to dentist <laughs> in five years, and she kisses the baby on the mouth. But... And, and then, so so when I, because here's my gut feeling, and I got a, 10 times more guts than you. I, I, uh, I have uh, a lot of gut feelings. And when I see a two-year-old that had that bombed out mouth, mom has a bombed out mouth, dad has a bombed out mouth, the babysitter, it, it, it's a family thing. Yes, so then yes we're eating no. the family, like, here, yes here no. try this pumpkin pie. And right. she's handing streptococcus mutans let's, on let's, you. Let's back that up. Um, the new hot research is in the human oral microbiome. And that I, I can give you some articles that I, I'd love for you 
to read about that. And, and the point that that makes is our body has more bacterial cells than human cells. So we're never going to be bacteria free. And in our mouths, we're always going to have bacteria. And, and even when a, a baby is born, they take on the, the, the microbiome of, of their mother. So yeah, I mean, it, you're going to get that transfer. But the thing is, even healthy enamel will have bacteria that can cause caries on it. Now, when you have like um, a child with more decay, yes, you're going to see higher levels of the more cariogenic bacteria. But that shift more often is happening because of their behaviors, meaning frequent consumption of carbohydrate or frequent consumption of an acidic or sugary beverage. So, you know, if they're sipping apple juice. So you juice, think it's more dietary than microbiome? It's both. It's both. It's bacteria and fermentable carbohydrates. So, it, you know, if... A now, I'm is, Irish. Did you know that vodka is not <laughs> sugar? Did you know that? Beer and right. wine are fermentable hey, well, we'll carbohydrates. We recommend bottles of vodka. But vodka it should help is the not. Baby sleep that's true. Too. Didn't someone? Didn't a dentist on the show yeah. tell me that? Right. That was, it was a dentist on the show tell me that. That right. beer and wine. But, but anyway. if your mouth is in this constant acidic state because you're constantly eating and, and drinking these things, your bacteria, your biofilm shifts to the more cariogenic bacteria, and they thrive. Like the more acidogenic and more acidic bacteria is having a, a party, and your teeth are going to rot. It's not because I have soft teeth, <laughs> which I love to say, right? You know, like it's genetic. No, it's more your behaviors. I mean, there, the, yes, you can have congenital enamel defects like hypoplasia, amelogenesis, but, but, like, but the what lion's you share do of to those teeth. So, is, so you think is, when a two-year-old comes in and needs eight pulpotomies and chromosome mm -hmm. crowns, that the diet is just the main cause? More often than not, yes, because there, there's no brushing. They're not getting fluoride. They're snacking, like our kids today, it's like they're graze all day long. I mean, no wonder there's so much childhood obesity and type two diabetes, because these kids like go to the mall and what do you see? You see kid in the stroller with their snack cup tethered to the stroller. They got their sippy cup or like a fountain drink from, you know, like with their lemonade and they're, they're eating crackers. Like crackers is one of the worst snacks you could possibly have, but parents are like kind of duped into thinking it's healthy because the the box says it's whole grain or like yeah. orga it's organic whole grain bunny crackers. Like they think it's healthy. They don't understand when their kid nibbles that all day long, they're just feeding the bacteria. It sticks to their teeth like paste. Like remember making paper mache, it was flour and water and it made paste, right? So oh, wow. you eat bunny crackers, <laughs> mix it with your saliva. It literally makes orange paste on their teeth and it just rots their teeth so if you have those poor feeding habits you're going to get a lot of cavities so, so as a pediatric dentist do you think do you think you ever change mom's behavior with the sure. decay of course there are some highly motivated parents who who generally didn't know that like they'll say you know gosh well i was giving them 100 percent juice or I give them only organic this and that, like they truly believe they were doing the right thing or, or they were exclusively breastfeeding or breastfeeding all night long because it, you know, La Leche League told them that breast milk can't give you cavities. Well, once you introduce carbohydrates, it's almost more cariogenic, especially if you're co-sleeping and letting the kid nurse all night long. Yeah, I, I mean, I, that I have is to, the most devastating. I have to interrupt you on that because, um, you know, the, in economics, the law of unintended consequences, you do something good yeah. and it can be bad. So yeah. I think it's that really is, cool that now when my daughter-in-laws are giving birth to baby, a lady mm -hmm. comes in to go over a breastfeeding. I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously I don't think they needed lessons the last two million years, <laughs> but someone's gonna come Somehow in now we do. And, and give you a deal. <laughs> but a lot of those girls that come in mm -hmm. and do that, they look into the baby's tongue and they say, oh, he's tongue tied, yeah. he needs to have a laser phrenectomy. Yeah. And that's another big debate. Right. I, in, in fact, I even, I had you a patient. You emailed me about it too. I and I told you, about sometimes it, so. they legitimately need it and benefit from it. But if, if you think that we humans have existed. Two million for, years. You know, for 108 all, billion humans. Like, how did we ever survive in a years. world where we didn't have pediatric dentists or dentists with lasers? You, you know what I mean? Like, you can overcome some of the things. But is it a, but are you doing a lot of that in your practice? Do you see a lot I of. I don't, but if I see someone with a, a legit tongue or lip tie, I will refer to a colleague that, that does it. But I would definitely. And who's that, say, a, like an oral surgeon or a parent? Or? There's a, I have a pediatrician in North 
that has a Phoenix laser. That, well, well, he actually uses um, scissor or scalpel. Yeah. And then so you just don't want to do pediatric it? Pediatric den. Well, I don't find that. The, like, I think 75%, especially of the, the maxillary uh, tie, like, most of that will um, self-correct as the alveolar bone grows. But if they have a true lip tie or true tongue tie, then sure, I'll, I'll recommend to have it done. But I think that there are you do it more being done than really need to yeah, be done more. because it's another billable procedure. So I want to back up on another deal. I got so many, I'm coming at you from so many angles. So um, very interesting, ASU is a big anthropology hotspot. I mean, we have Lucy, the mm -hmm. 1.6 million year old, complete, hominid, 30 six inch tall, 17 year old girl. But anyway, the anthropologists, independent of dentistry, have really been posting a lot of studies amongst themselves saying, why is there no malocclusions over the last two million years? And then 150 years ago, they just explode. And then their own non-dental mind are saying, well, probably because um, they were nursing for a couple of years. And now if a baby has a trouble nursing, you give it some sippy cup with a, yeah. a gorilla size or a, a, a whale size <laughs> right. nipple on it. And then with, back in the last two million years, your mom probably threw you a mastodon bone and you were chewing on it. Now she's feeding you puree apple Goo sauce. in a pouch. Yeah. So, <laughs> that, so that's really good for business too. Have you know, like, like everything is pureed and sweet and in <laughs> yeah. the pouch. And so you have all these so there's no flavor forces. aversion, right? They don't know how to, they have to go to feeding therapy because they don't know how to eat food. Like, you know, sit your kid at the table, eat a meal as a family, you know, don't just hand them crackers and goo in but, a stroller. <laughs> but, but we have, we have, um, I mean, um, we have 10,800 uh, 10, orthodontists putting the babies of 325 million people, the herd's 325 million, mm -hmm. and they're throwing all their babies through a 10,800 person orthodontic machine because the kid never fought nursing. He never chewed. He never had any forces <laughs> spreading out his maxilla. Mm -hmm. And that's what the anthropologists are saying. What do you as a pediatric dentist well, say you know, to I, what they're I've saying? I've been seeing those comments that like, if you're breastfed, you're, you won't need braces. And, and that's such a loaded statement. I'm sorry. I and mean, there's plenty of kids who were breastfed. Like I was breastfed till I was one. I had, my mouth was a hot mess. I had two oral surgeries, impacted canine, braces, and still my teeth aren't perfect. So, you know, it's not just the breastfeeding. Like, right, right. It's, it's not, multi like, It's a wonderful thing to do. It's, I breastfeed both of my kids. But, 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 it, but it does beg the question, when, when you, so they say uh, um, we're 2 million years old as a species, 108 million have come and died. And there's 7.5 million alive today. And of that first 108 million, there's almost no malocclusions. So then you look at the herd today of 7.5 billion, and it's rampant widespread. So mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm sure, sure it's like multi -variant. processed food probably has a lot to do with it because, like you said, you know, back then you're hunting and gathering and you're tearing and, you know, whereas now things are highly processed. So I'm 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 sure that has something to do with it. I, but do you see any like pediatric dentists, like um, coaching your parents that? You know, you could prevent ortho if you were eating mastodon shit and chewing on a uh, goat <laughs> I rib. I have not done that, but maybe that's like a new way we need to, I don't know. Yeah. Because, <laughs> I, because, a trend. because I, I still, um, I still don't see dentistry, like, like in Phoenix, we fluoridated the water mm -hmm. and um, that's preventative, but the profession as whole, like I don't see any of the orthodontists in any of the schools taking the lead to try to find out why the first 108 billion humans didn't need an orthodontist. I don't see any of the practices talking about. I, I don't, I don't, it, it's, it's like, it's, it's like. an interesting question. It, it, it's, it I mean, reminds as a pediatric me of dentist? HIV in 1979. It just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they, they talk about prevention in fluoridated cavities, but they don't talk about mm -hmm. prevention. And the media, whenever a child dies in office, of course, a lot of stuff went wrong. Right, it's like but the, they the bad But dentist. the media never, yeah. ever, singularly will ask, well, Jeanette, why did your child right. need eight root canals at age two? And that, what, a, what, right. a, what a dad. What right. a mom and I dad. That, and that's, that's my frustration, too. It's like we're trying to fix the problems. We didn't put the cavities there. You know, we're, then we become the doormat like it's all our fault when we're, you know, we're just trying to help. And it, it, it's frustrating. It reminds when, me, it, 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 your job reminds me that I was talking to a friend of mine and um, his son was there and his son was all upset. 
because his, how, what grade are you in, in 10? Is that fourth grade? When you're 10 years old? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. They wanted to hold his son back mm -hmm. because he can't read. And he's all mad at the school and he's all mad and all this stuff like that. And I'm just looking at him and say, buddy, buddy, the t that's not the teacher's baby. Mm -hmm. That's freaking your baby. So you're telling me you have a 10 year old baby that can't read. How about you're a really shitty parent? Right. Well, that's the thing It's like we have to take ownership of the problem. And, and a problem with many parents is they don't want to take ownership of the fact that the cavities are in many ways their own fault for lack of hygiene and poor feeding. You know, they want to blame it on something else. Soft teeth, you know, oh, it's the dad has bad teeth. Like they just yeah, want, totally. they want the excuse. <laughs> right. and, and that is a delicate discussion because again, I want to empathize with the parents and, and they don't like when you're like, you know, you're a crappy parent, here's your $5,000 treatment plan for general, you, you know, we need, there's a, there's a way to sort of kindly open that discussion of, you know, okay, you're here now to fix this problem and I want to help you do that. You know, and let's get back to the root cause of the problem. What can we do to help prevent this from happening again? What can we do with their diet? And I give them a handout on a, a, like a food-based approach to cavity prevention. Um, I use one from Roger Lucas, who I don't know if you've podcasted with him, but that I'll have to have you connect Where with him. Where is he from? Um, from Washington. But a diet-based approach to cavity prevention, because again, it's what you, often what you're eating and when, and um, we'll do look you, at do that. You ever, do you ever recommend that for their next baby, they choose a different mate? <laughs> no, <laughs> um, I don't. <laughs> I, but we're, we're talking about colleagues. I got to ask you one, one thing for, before I forget it. Um, you have another friend, we both have a common, Joel Berg. Yeah. Who was a pediatric dentist, mm -hmm. uh, Seattle? Yes. And uh, there's a big, that made newspapers. What, what what was that all about, or do you not want to talk about that? Um, I honestly don't know enough about it. I yeah. know that he is moving here. Um, he's moved to Phoenix. Mm -hmm. But no I way. know when's he moving to Phoenix? I think he's already here. I, it, it's a recent thing. But um, do you have his contact information? Yeah. Do you have his cell phone? Yeah. Oh my God! You're I'll call, let's, you up. <laughs> let's call him right now on the podcast. Is yeah. he gonna is he gonna practice? I think he does more on like the business end now and pro and practices. Because he's a board certified pediatric dentist, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, having Did you know not I am gone too? to university, you're a board certified pediatric dentist? I am. I bought it That's on eBay to me. Yeah, and okay. a black belt in karate and an Eagle Scout. That's it was awesome. all for $9.99. That's it. You, you paid too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, I did not know Joel Berg moved here. Yeah, so it, I, I don't know. I know that there so were financial issues. So he's a business consultant? With, with the, um, yeah, the, the budget. It was, with the program. But I wasn't talking about the budget in the school. I was talking mm -hmm. about the silver diamine fluoride oh. research. Well, he, he wasn't really involved with that. Are you thinking of Jeremy Horse at UCSF? Cause he no, does, I, thought it was, I thought it was University of Seattle did a big silver diamine fluoride. San Francisco had a big paper on it. Um, uh, University they, of Washington didn't? You're probably thinking of the UCSF protocol for SDF. Yeah. That was like, um, that was a huge turning point. The New York Times article brought a lot of public and dentist attention to this as an option. Dude, it you were a rock star for a month on social media. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think, I didn't run into a single dentist in Arizona for over a month, did you say, where they didn't say, see one of our local homies made the New York Times? Well, it's funny because it was good and bad because there was a lot of backlash to that article and I, I certainly took the heat for it. One of the things that people were most upset about was the fact that the mom said how much she paid for the SDF, and people were pissed, <laughs> you know? And, and the How thing much is did she that say the she paid? $25, and the thing is- um, That was too much? I didn't, the reporter asked me, and I said, you know, listen, as dentists, we don't feel comfortable discussing fees because it's considered collusion or price fixing, and I wouldn't tell her what I charge for a filling and what I charge for the SDF. So she went to the mom, and the mom was like, oh yeah, well I paid this, and then I paid that. And then that made the article. So of course everyone jumped on me like, I can't believe that, you know, and you're you're in Arizona and I'm in this like hoity toity, this and that. And people were really upset. And, and you know, and I and I explained that I wasn't the one who put the price out there. But I mean, come on. I mean, if if one drop is basically pennies per tooth when you really think about it, it's like, well, how much upcharge can you really <laughs> Well well it's <laughs> but, it's it's um it's one of the biggest problems in healthcare is almost 
is 80% of the cost or variable cost of labor. Like like the S&P 500 averages 53% mm -hmm. labor. Well, you pay the dentist 35% staff, 25%. There's your 55, it's all the same. Um, then you have lab um, 10, you have um, um, supply six, you have mortgage five. And then when you go to the hospital, they don't have a time bill. Well, you were in the hospital for 12 hours and we charge a thousand dollars an hour. So they have to go off to things they bill. So then the right. media makes fun. Well, they problem. charge me $500 for Tylenol. Yeah. But when I go to the Hilton, I mean, imagine if the Hilton couldn't charge me for a room. They had to say, well, you use toilet paper. You use you use a Too towel much toilet paper. <laughs> and you use the right. sheet yeah. and you're like, why well, didn't call it under the, you know, it's, it's, they need, right. uh, when, when 80% of your costs are time based, you need just a freaking hourly rate. Right. And, and when, and when I was getting my MBA from ASU, it was frightening because there were 200 kids in there and some of them were these local hospitals. And they said, it's, we, you know, like Medicaid or Medicare insurance will pay us like $40 for an exam. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that exam will cost us 200. But they'll give us $100,000 for a bypass and $70,000 for colon cancer surgery. Yeah. So we have to do, if, as long as we do three or four surgeries a day that are the big ones, a, a coronary artery bypass graft, a mastectomy, mm -hmm. a colon cancer. So as long as we do three or four big surgeries a day, we cover everything we do at a loss. I'm like, well, damn. Do I, I right. mean, that, well, that, that's right. That and, brings and, us to another problem. And that problem. Has, and you're a woman um, doctor. Um, the United States has the highest cesarean rate of any advanced country. So you have right. countries where the doctors are on salary. It's very controversial. Yeah, well, well, you, but I, I've seen solid data where the OBGYNs are on salary and they have about a 4% OB, uh, cesarean section. Mm -hmm. And then I see America with a, a one in four. Right. Um, I, I have a staff member, four babies, all four C-sections, and it's just like, and none of her right. four children uh, right. needed a C-section. And, and, and why have many left that profession? Because their malpractice rates were obscene because they're all getting sued. Anytime anything went wrong, we're suing the doctor. We're, you know, not everyone has this, this easy, perfect birth. Like we, like everyone wants, again, people want to blame someone, you know? And then it's easy to blame the deepest pockets, you know, so let's blame the OBGYN and let's sue them. Yeah, yeah. So then the fear is like, you know, like if I delayed, if I waited too long for the natural vaginal birth, now, you know, so now maybe some are, are jumping to the cesarean because there's that fear of, of litigation. And then, yeah, the flip side is like, are we doing it because you, know, you get you know, reimbursed more? Do you know where that birth? name came from? From Caesar. Yeah, did you know that? Yeah. Isn't that just amazing? <laughs> it was the first city. It's, it's like disturbing to think back that like, I'm surprised. It was the first city. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, kind of a weird fact just came out from these same anthropologists. Yeah. They, Rome was the first city to hit a million, but you always found all the ancient hominid fossils in Eastern Africa. Huh. And now Germany just found a 9.8 million tooth. Because it didn't make sense. I was like, it, well, if the oldest people were in Africa, you'd think that's yeah. where the Great Wall of China would be or... Um, the pyramids, or you would just think of, that, but so the first they hit a million. Now they just found a nine point eight million year old tooth, and um, but yeah, Caesar. When if you were one in ten women died during childbirth, right? And if you were, if they thought the woman was dying on the side of the road with a moving baby, the soldiers would pull their sword, lance open the stomach to save the child. Yeah. Ooh. Wow. It's barbaric. And and now you get a and now you get an honor trophy just for participating <laughs> in your child's sport. <laughs> that, that was my article for Dental Town. Everyone gets a trophy. Um, but so here here's another dilemma: is is we're fee for service based, right? So we get paid or incentivized by the procedures that we do. So the problem is that the most invasive procedures are reimbursed the highest, but they don't necessarily produce the the best result, i.e. health, better health for the patient, whereas the things that do have the highest impact or the best, like for example, sealants an 80% reduction of caries or SDF and upwards of 80% arrest of caries, those things are reimbursed okay, that's the, the let's, smallest. So you yeah. know, if, if you have someone who's only gonna get X dollars to do SDF, but I can go do a stainless steel crown, like it's a problem. Um, 
you know, this it's another controversial topic. Is like, do we stay fee for service or do we go to now, capitation? Have, are we measured on? Do you health? have any relationships with any of the Arizona insurance companies? I mean, are you? No. You're not drinking buddies with like the head of Delta or no. MetLife or anything like that. <laughs> Um, uh-uh. yeah. I am on the Arizona um, Dental Association's Access Subcommittee. Access is our Medicaid here. so we. Which was Obama's um, craziest thing he did is, I mean, he obviously never owned a business because when he rolled out Obamacare, he had a federal Medicare program that mm-hmm. everybody knows. But what did he decide to do? He decided to go through Medicaid, which every state is different. And I had so many patients saying, oh, I hate Obamacare. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, you're on access. That's Obamacare. No, it's not. It's access. Mm-hmm. And so you had all these people who loved their state Medicaid telling me they hated Obamacare. And it's like, how? I mean, imagine going to market with a product and it was going to have a different name in every state. Mm-hmm. I mean, you just can't do that. Right. Well, and then the funny thing here is we have so many different plans under access. And like they each have their own rules and you have to creden- credential through them separately. It's like you have to go through flaming hoops when you want to be a Medicaid provider. Which, you and know, you are a Medicaid provider. I am provider. a Medicaid provider. And why do you do that? I mean, it's not for financial why reasons. Not? Right. I mean, we the reimbursements are, are terrible. To me, but, it's like it's my, pro- I, I have a duty to take care of kids. So you, know, so you know you're losing money on Medicaid? And you do it anyway? I do it anyway. I, yeah. I've always thought you're just... <laughs> I told Ryan when you came over, I said, uh, I said, she is the most solid person. Well, you know, this is the problem. You know, a- let's get back to access to care, okay? So, you know, right now we have the debate going on in Arizona with dental therapists. If I thought dental therapists would solve our access to care program, I would be the first person in line saying, woo I want dental therapy. But having more bodies to do more of the same old, same old that hasn't cut caries rate in children, it's not the answer. So right? are you for dental therapists or against them? Again, if I thought it would solve access to care right. problems in our state, I would be the first one in line. But graduating but were a bunch you of for dental therapists against, it? against, especially right. in the way it's currently written, because the problem is there's nothing that's going to guarantee that the dental therapist would actually go into the areas that need them. I would bet money that what's going to happen is so, they're all going to settle so into then, the metropolitan area. So you've been here since 2005. When mm-hmm. did AT still open? About that time. It was right around then. Right. So now we have two dental schools. When I went to dental but, school, we didn't have any dental schools in Arizona. And now we have two. So we have we have lots. It's, it's not, a, it's not a provider a problem. It's a distribution problem. How, how many does Midwestern graduate a year? Is it 150? I Ryan, honestly don't know. can you see what the graduating 100? size class of it, it, Midwestern and Glendale and AT still? But, um, but the, 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 you know, I, I've been watching this problem. It's a distribution problem for 30 years. Like, yeah. there would be a dentist in, um, say, um, a small town in Kansas, you know, half the way from Wichita to Denver, yeah. in the middle of nowhere. And he can't get a girl born and raised in Wichita or Kansas City, Kansas, to move to his small town and be a hygienist. Right. So then he goes to the local high school, mm-hmm. and he knows he's got to get a girl born in this town of 5,000. Who's, who's only, and then he'll say, okay, write me an essay on why you want to be a hygienist. You might win a scholarship. So two girls wrote an essay, and he's like, dude, I need two hygienists. So he, he said, I'm, I'm writing the check for mm-hmm. you to go to high school. But then when they applied to hygiene school, they didn't get accepted mm. because they needed a 3.85 GPA. Yeah. So they fill up this class with all these kids born in the metropolitans yeah. who get 4.0s in algebra and geometry and trig. Yeah. And then Blythe, Arizona, the rest of its life doesn't get a dentist, a right. hygienist, a registrar. So to go into those deans, you talk to those deans, say it's a distribution problem. Yeah. Do me a favor. Don't accept anybody in your dental school from a town that's larger than 250 thousand <laughs> and then and then what do they say well you know the u.s news and world report you know they they say what our average dat score is and we want to have we want to have our well are you serving u.s news and world report are you serving the taxpayer base of arizona and i mean i think if every met, and then you look at the largest fastest growing economies in arizona and there's mines out in the middle of nowhere mm-hmm. and you talk to these mine owners and they say i need i need right now today 10 mechanical engineers but guess where they all are in tempe and scottsdale yeah. and then i say well can you live out here and they're like what are you out of your mind but the kids born in that town 
Um, they love the fact that their kid can go ride a motorcycle and shoot mm -hmm. a 22 rifle. And, and you, I mean, you, you carry a 22 rifle into the gasoline station when you're 10. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, but those people were born in that lifestyle. And this, the schools, the government, the hygiene schools, they're so worried about that you got an A in geometry. And I've never used geometry, calculus, or trig mm -hmm. in 30 years of dentistry, and I bet I spent a thousand hours mm -hmm. in the library memorizing that useless crap. Okay, so we we agree okay, it's wait. a distribution problem. Okay, so um, the um, let's talk about what the other part. It's not just, just distribution. Real quick. Midwestern class size is 141. I was close. And the average GPA was 3.47. AT still uh, class size is 76. And they accept 2.3%. So, um, Ryan, okay, so so when people say, well, why do the dental schools raise their price 10,000 a year? Well, AT still, I mean, it's hundred grand, $100,000 a year, and they only accepted 2.3% of oh, their applicants. Yeah. And then that dentist says, well, why are they raise the price? Well, dude, if you could double the price of your crown <laughs> to Delta Dental, you would do it. So don't don't be mad at the schools. But um, so, so they're graduates, so what is that combined? Um, 141, sorry, I'm blind. And 70, did you say 76? And 76. So what's 6 plus 1? 217. <laughs> 217? 